Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Today is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. We're going to start today with the word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy, and we pray that you give us ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to us in these last days. We pray you bless those that are watching today, uh, this broadcast. We pray for our co-hosts. We pray the Spirit of God would unify us in our efforts, touch someone's heart who has not yet come to Christ, and cause them to say yes to the Savior so they may have eternal life. Thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome Amen. to the Christian Amen. and the Culture, a program designed to help you face issues of today and think about the Word of God and how it applies to our daily lives. So many things are happening in our world, and we can't wait to dive into our topic today, where yes. we're looking at the churches in the book of Revelation and try to draw some correlation between those churches and the church in 2020. As always, joining me are my co-hosts, Pastor Brian Weatherspoon of Tabernacle Harvest Church in Pottstown. Pastor, how are you today? Very well, Bishop. Thank you for uh, having me once again. Christian and culture family, God bless you all. And as always, this is going to be an exciting topic, and this is one of my favorites, so stay tuned. <laughs> and thank you. And Pastor Tim Baldwin from Bethel Deliverance Church Northeast, who is also celebrating a church anniversary. Happy anniversary, Pastor hey. Tim. Yes, How are thank you, you so today? much. I'm doing well. Can't complain. God bless you, Bishop, and uh, welcome to the Christian and the Culture. Um, as we always say, um, I think we've We've said it a million times over, but we're excited to be here, and we hope right. the show is a blessing to you. Praise the Lord. Gentlemen, we started looking at uh, three churches in the book of Revelation. We started with Ephesus, who had the problem of performing much church work, but losing their intimacy with the Lord. From there, we went to Laodicea, a church that we concluded walked in an abundance of arrogance and pride that caused them to become lukewarm. Today, we want to begin our conversation looking at the church of Thyatira. And John makes some very, very strong accusations about the church at Thyatira. He speaks about a prophetic person, and uh, he calls them Jezebel. Now, we know this is no reference to the Jezebel of the book of 1 Kings, but this was a, a, a literal person who walked mm -hmm. around the church seducing God's people. And the interesting thing in this particular letter is that while the Lord identifies the sinful character, he speaks about mercy. He says, I gave her space to repent, and she mm -hmm. did not take it. I'd like to ask you, do we see that same spirit of seduction in our church today? And is it being manifest through certain prophetic words and prophetic actions? Pastor Brian? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, th this is one of the most dangerous of the churches because uh, this individual is, you know, it's a person that obviously asserts to uh, some level of spiritual influence. And, uh, and, and the scripture says that she called herself a uh, prophetess, meaning that she kind of, you know, asserted and uh, assumed her own role as prophetess. And uh, history says also that uh, Jesus had a little bit more slant on the star, the pastor of this church, because, uh, you know, it's alluded to historically that it could have even been his wife, somebody that, you know, really was in a prominent place, but, you know, kind of had the influence and used that influence to water down the message. And that is where you see Thyatira going and the excessiveness of tolerance, which I think is where the church is today that we tolerate every and anything and we tolerate any and everybody. And, and it's almost like there's no more standards. So I think the sin of our day is, is tolerance. We're too tolerant to the sin that's in our world. Okay, that's good. That's good observation. Pastor Tim, why is prophecy so seductive? <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I think everybody wants to know uh, what's going to happen in the future. You know, I think we, we, uh, and, and we really misinterpret it because when you look at prophets of the Old Testament, prophets of the Old Testament uh, spoke to the ills of uh, the culture, spoke to the kings, uh, and gave them godly direction and correction. 
Uh, but prophecy today has been turned into a fortune cookie. You know, what can I get? God's right. going to give you this and God's going to give you that. Uh, uh, First Timothy 4, 1 says, uh, it talks about um, that the spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times, uh, people will depart from the faith, giving into to, uh, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And, you know, and, 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 and when you look at that scripture, that text, we're living that right now. And in this church, one of the things that was happening is that these false prophets, they were false prophets and they were leading people into idolatry. And, and we're seeing that today with some of the things that are going on. We have prophets getting up, giving these words and, and pushing people toward uh, figures uh, uh, instead of uh, who God is or instead of the spirit of the Lord. And so, so we're seeing that today unfold right before our eyes. You made a statement at the beginning of your response, you said people like to know the future. Uh, unpack yeah. that a little bit. I, I, I want to mm -hmm. ask a question uh, about that, but I want you to just, you know, lay it out a little more for our audience. Yeah, I, I think when I, when I say the future, Bishop, I, I think people are getting misunderstand prophecy because prophecy is uh, being prophetic is not just about knowing the future, but that's, that's right. what it's become in our day. It's become, okay, in six weeks, the Lord is going to bless you, you know, in six weeks, I, I see, you know, it's your season, you know, and so if we have fallen into that trap of individuals who, who have really become false prophets, and, and, and it has caused us again to really fall away from the authenticity of who God is and, and what his kingdom is about. Okay, that's, that's good. Uh, Pastor Brian, today, many prophets, well, I'm going to use that term because you know, I don't want to judge anyone. So I'm just going to say many people who prophesy and call themselves prophets, there seems to be for some reason a tremendous amount of prophecies that are pointed towards destruction. Mm. Uh, I like the Bible. I mean, I really love the word of God. And I'm trying to find a balance between prophets who spoke warnings and sp prophets who spoke uh, blessing and reclamation, if you will. Sure. Uh, one comes to mind, the book of Joel. Joel gets a prophet, prophecy of judgment mixed yeah. with a prophecy of restoration. Am I right in suggesting that true prophets of God should give both? Absolutely. Absolutely. God always get, and this is what we always say, God always gives us a way of escape. Uh, you know, there, there's no there's no closed door on a salvific message. We serve a God who from Genesis to Revelation shows us the attitude and the heart of redemption. And the whole narrative of the scripture is about redeeming souls back to him. So God is really technically not in the business of destroying people that he's trying to redeem, that he's trying to save and reconcile to himself. So that's re he's really not in the fear business. Man is. Okay. And here's the truth. Fear sells. Uh, fear will cause you to come out of your pocket when nothing else will. Fear will draw out of you a reaction that may even cause desperation. And the shame is we have some using fear of scripture. And, and it also, and it's just a slight side note, it also shows the lack of discernment in the church that we are having a very hard time discerning what is the voice of God from those that are just people that <laughs> may not be bad folks, but just are prophesying from their own will okay. and what they want for themselves. So I think if we sharpen the discernment, we'll be back on course. But true prophecy may give you some judgment, but it'll also give you a way of escape. Okay. Pastor Tim, Jonah. Jonah. Jonah is one of my favorite books, primarily because Jonah uh, didn't want to do what he was told to do. <laughs> and why is that my favorite? Because it really speaks to the heart of humans. Uh, usually the call, the commission of God is often something we don't want to do because it pulls us out of our comfort zone. But I, I need you, Pastor Tim, to just enlighten us on this fact. When Nineveh repents, Jonah says to God, I knew you were going to do that. I knew you were going to forgive them. Do we see a formula here in the book of Jonah of warning, which leads to repentance? And if that is true, there's a compound question, so you got to listen to carefully. 
<laughs> if that is true, if that mode is true, warning, which leads to repentance, then would that be a conditional prophecy of judgment in the mind of God? All right, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to destroy you. But in my mind, I know you're going to repent. So I'm going to forgive you. What's the what's the formula that we're looking at here? You, you know, Bishop, when you look at that text, we see this throughout scripture where, where God, you, you look at the book of the uh, book of Judges, you know, where there was destruction and God would always send someone in to to bring a word of a correction. And then there then the whole repentance, Israel will come back and then they would go back into living there the, the way that they wanted to. And so, Bishop, I do believe uh, that, you know, it, it's almost uh, uh, like touchy to say conditional Whereas, because we do know the sovereignty of God, that God knows what we're going to do. But there is this thing with God where God wants the participation of his people. You know, he, he, we know that, that uh, Jonah doesn't want to go to Nineveh because Nineveh was uh, with, at war with his people. They came and, 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 and there was this war and, and they uh, oppressed his people. And Jonah says, I don't want to go. And so, so there is this conditional thing and God does know what, what we want to do. But I do believe that God likes the participation or wants the participation of his people. And so there are times where God will send a uh, correction uh, and give us an opportunity to repent. And so that there, that judgment <clears throat> that may come on us will not come. When we look at it today, Bishop, I look at it from this perspective. When we are living uh, uh, within these, the parameters of sin, if we are living a lifestyle of sin, God will give us signs and God will give us, you know, these warnings so that our own actions won't destroy our lives or won't destroy us. And then and within that, he gives us an opportunity to repent and to come back to him. And so so when you look at it from a conditional perspective, it looks that way. But I, I believe that God wants our to participation. He wants us to be involved with this process, with the with the redemption process. Okay. And Pastor Brian said something about the church at Thyatira. He said, God gave this woman space to repent. Yeah. Is that the norm for God? Does God give us space to repent? And it's difficult. And, and I mean, let's just really analyze this. Uh, God knows the end from the beginning. He knows what's going to happen. So I would say my view would be whenever he speaks, whenever he says something, He's not speaking to the moment. He's speaking to the end. Yeah. You know, he knows he knows how it's going to turn out. I mean, he knew Absolutely. that Job would be restored. He knew the children of Israel. And, and here, here's even a, a, a better analysis. In Jeremiah uh, 29, he says, all right, you're going back into Babylonian captivity and you're going to be there for 70 years. But while you're there, learn how to prosper. Learn yeah. to learn how to be successful, buy property, yeah. build houses, get married, have children, get your children married. Because when you come out of the bondage, you have to have a victor's mindset. In that, that book there in Revelation, where he speaks to the character of the church, do you think he's giving us time now? So many people have said that the pandemic is God's judgment against the church. I, in my world, the jury's still out on that. I, I don't see God's judgment as a plaything. Secondly, I don't see God's judgment as something that can be removed by a vaccine. That's when God right. <laughs> speaks to us from that yeah. Thyatira perspective, what's he saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's a blow to the church basically to get their head in the right direction and, and not be swayed by. And once again, what... What we're seeing is a huge deficit in discernment uh, uh, and, and probably a lack of boldness to confront the things that we clearly know are Jezebelian. And uh, from how things approach in leadership, uh, how we even choose leaders, how we allow moving and working of the spirit, which it should happen in church, but not without order. Uh, all these things, I think, were called into question from the Lord himself as to why are you tolerating this? Yeah. The upsurge of sexual sin in the church uh, is not even something amongst the laity in as much as you hear it worse and very egregious amongst those in leadership. It is Jezebelian. Uh, uh, the lack of control, discipline, 
Uh, no, there is no even spiritual discipline in church. We're afraid to do it because pastors think if they really discipline congregants or somebody in sin, that they'll lose them. So there's a lack of all of this. And I think the Lord is saying the church can't be powerful if it's held hostage by Jezebel. And we have to shake ourselves and get back in the right direction. <clears throat> okay, that's that's good word. Pastor Tim, <laughs> Ezekiel talks about uh, the harsh judgment coming to those who don't teach to make a difference. He says our princes, our, our, our political leaders, they are pretty much just ungodly, undisciplined. Our religious leaders have gone about to do things that satisfy themselves. And God says one of the things that he really becomes angry about is the lack of difference between yeah. his people and the world. And he says there's no one to teach them the difference. And then comes that classic phrase, because I could not find anyone to stand in the gap, make up the hedge, then destruction came. In light of the church's slant towards Thyatira, if God is looking for a difference, how are we to make up that difference, Pastor Tim? Bishop, I say this all the time. This is one of my favorite phrases, that we have to be better models. And, and, and better models, not just biblically as it relates to teaching, but better models with our lives. Pastor Brian alluded to it uh, just a few moments ago where he talked about um, the ungodliness in the church and much of it coming from leadership. You know, how, how can we teach from a distinctive perspective when our lives don't reflect the word of God that we're teaching? And so uh, for me, it, it's as simple as having sound models of what kingdom stewardship looks like as it relates to my life. Uh, sound models as it relates to what, what does godly marriages look like? How should I handle conflict? And what should my finances look like? And, you know, all of the practical things that we don't think about where we go so far into spiritual space, where it's just like, you know, a church is about just prophecy and, and, you know, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, when it's just like, you know what, go to work and treat your employer with respect. You know, go, treat your wife uh, differently. Have a distinctness when it comes to how you handle your your business affairs. And you shouldn't have a, a, a sketchy uh, character um, and all of those things. So, so uh, you know, Bishop, I look at the more practical things. You know, people need to see models in every facet of life and not just people proclaiming the gospel in front. And then they come down from the podium and their life is a mess behind the scenes. You know, people need good models. They need good models of what it looks like to be kingdom uh, citizens and, and, and leaders in the, uh, in the kingdom. There are some principles in Isaiah chapter 58 where he talks about the fast that he chosen. Now, I'm sure all three of us have read Isaiah 58, you know, until it can probably just be quoted from memory. But as we were in our season of fasting of, uh, last week, and we use that passage as our key verse. There was something that I saw that I hadn't seen before. And when God says, this is the fast that I've chosen, that a person afflicts his soul and humbles himself and comes in to pray before me that he may loose the bound and set the captives free. So that was the spiritual uh, part of it, that fasting enables the people of God to loose those that are in bondage and set those that are in captivity free. But then I noticed he gave a practical, regular side. And that side, he said, to feed those that are hungry, to help those that are poor, to help the disenfranchised. So it seems like there was uh, the spiritual context and then the natural context. And Pastor Absolutely. Tim, you just seem to talk about the natural context that God wants us to be examples, examples of, of his love and his principles in our work our environment, our families, our relationships, and all of those things. Have we failed in doing that? Or we don't want to be as draconian with that, but have we done a less than perfect job? If you, if you rate us in that context, uh, you know, doing the practical things on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being absolutely godly, <laughs> where would you put us 
I, I would I would put us somewhere between six and seven. We got we got some work to do. You're optimistic. You know? I tell <laughs> you, you got the real we, spirit we, of love. We we have some work to do, Bishop. We're not we're not all dreck. You know, there there's much work to do, but but there are a lot of people who are you know living the word out and being godly examples and and allowing other people to see as the scriptures say their good works that 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 their father in heaven may be glorified you know um but but we got work to do it's it's okay. it's no doubt you know we have work to do okay. now we've been hearing a lot of talk about the sin of abortion in fact one of our listeners wrote me a rather interesting email addressing abortion and there is so much talk from the church about the sin of abortion. Now, I want to ask Pastor Brian, while we acknowledge the hateful sin of abortion, while we do identify it being a, a, a wicked and rotten thing, what should the church's response be to that particular sin? Should we wait on the government or should we have a response? Well, surely we should have a response. And that first response is to, to have a feeling for, to have a sense of sorrow for the, uh, the act of abortion, you know. And, and yet it's, 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 a, it's a double-headed monster almost because you know, we should have a heart for the souls that are lost, uh, but we also need a redemptive measure for those that go through such a thing. So... Uh, this is where the Christian, and once again, I'm going to harp on this, and I want everybody to hear me. What we are lacking in is discernment. We're, we're loving the things that we should hate, and we're hating the things that we should love. So we're putting all of our eggs in the wrong basket. It is not to hate people who have gone through an abortion. It's a horrible act, no matter how you've done it, or for whatever reason you've done it. It's a horrible act. So there needs to be redemption, and you need to know that Christ will forgive you for doing such a thing. However, on the other side, we also know that, uh, listen here, it's, it's, we should have a heartache for the children that are lost, and we should have a burden for prayer, and we should be willing, as you said, Bishop, to afflict our souls, fast and pray, so that God would change us around spiritually. Okay. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left uh, on this broadcast, and uh, we pray that you were touched in a way to evaluate your walk. You know, one day you're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Yeah. And I want to make this very clear. When we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, Jesus isn't going to say, who did you vote for? No, he's not. He's not going to say, were you a Republican or a Democrat or Tea Party or Independent? He's going to say, what did you do for my kingdom? Yes. Was your life a reflection of my grace? Were you judgmental? Did you speak evil of rulers that I put in position? Put in place. Did you speak down to those who were disenfranchised? Did you speak up for those who could not speak up for themselves? I don't know about you. Hell, hell doesn't frighten me in the sense that I'm not going there. I mean, hell is a horrible place, but I'm glad because of Jesus, I'm not going to hell. But, yeah. we're, but the judgment seat frightens me. Yeah, it does. The judgment seat frightens yeah. me because at that seat, my works will be evaluated, as will yours. Mm -hmm. And your motives for doing the things that you've done will come into question. Wow. I want to encourage you today to evaluate your life and make sure you're not a member of the Church of Thyatira, that you right. have lost all balance, that you have lost all discipline, that you've lost all absolutes and nothing matters anymore. Wow. You need to give up that lifestyle and surrender yourself to Christ afresh. You may be born again, but sometimes the, the, the fellowship begins to lessen. So we want to encourage you today to think in terms of standing before the judgment seat of Christ and mm -hmm. hearing him say, well done, or you could have done better. Better. Thanks for joining us today. Wow. It's always a privilege to bring you the word of God. And we thank God that you were with us today. May God's blessings be upon you in everything you do. Jesus is Lord. God bless you. 
Discover God's design for family through Bishop Eric Lambert's sermon series, Strengthening the Family. This powerful series will provide you with practical instruction on how to strengthen your family relationships using scriptures from the Word of God. Receive the five-part series, Strengthening the Family, on CD or DVD for your donation of $35 or more. To order, call 1-800-550-3284 or visit ericlambertministries.org. Get your copy of Strengthening the Family so you can build a family life that brings victory to your home and glory to God. Bishop Eric A. Lambert Jr. is committed to influencing our culture with Christ. In his book, The Christian in the Culture, Bishop Lambert explores practical ways to avoid becoming ensnared by the trends of today's culture. Order your copy of The Christian in the Culture and achieve daily victorious living. Visit ericlambertministries.org to purchase the book and discover more resources that will enrich your Christian walk. The Bethel Deliverance app is now available to download for free at Apple Store and Google Play. You can tune into Sunday services through live stream, view video sermons on demand, listen to audio messages through podcasts, send prayer requests, communicate through social media, and you can contribute to the ministry simply by using today's technology. Get access to all of Bethel's media outlets and church events right at your fingertips. Go to the Apple Store or Google Play and download Bethel Deliverance to get connected today. Praise the Lord. I'm Bishop Eric Lambert. I want to welcome you to the Eric Lambert Ministries website. On this website, you will be able to get information about books, CDs, DVDs, and even the printed word designed to help you in your walk with Christ. You'll find information about our YouTube channel and the services that we have at Bethel Deliverance International Church. And we want you to understand that our ministry is designed to lift up Jesus, to glorify his name, and to get you, the listener, connected to the power of the Holy Ghost. I am excited about the Eric Lambert Ministries website, and I want you to join us as often as you can, and we guarantee two things. You'll have a closer walk with Jesus. Number two, your life will be richer. God bless you. Access resources that will enrich your Christian walk today by visiting ericlambertministries.org. That's ericlambertministries.org. The Climbing Higher broadcast with Bishop Eric A. Lambert Jr. is a part of the media outreach ministry of Bethel Deliverance International Church. Our goal is to reach the world with powerful messages of faith, truth, and victory taught from God's Word. You can take part in this significant mission by becoming a media partner. Your weekly, monthly, or one-time gift goes directly towards reaching the masses with life-changing messages of hope from God's Word. To find out more, visit the BethelDeliverance.org media link for additional information about our partnership options. We thank you for your seeds of support. The Christian and the Culture is a production of Bethel Deliverance International Church. Visit BethelDeliverance.org. Thank you for watching. Be blessed.